submission really comes into play when you guys don't agree. Because at the end of the day, it's still the husband's job to make the last decision and to be the leader of the family. Ooh. Hey ladies, welcome back to another episode of Homework. Today, I am really excited to share that I am going to be doing a Q&A. I asked you guys questions on my Instagram at young.homemakersclub and I'm gonna be answering them today. So without further ado, let's get right into it. But before we get started, I did wanna share that this episode is sponsored by Young Homemakers Club. Young Homemakers Club is a community designed for women just like you who are wanting to learn more about biblical womanhood, homemaking, and how to be a better wife and mother. All of that is in one community for you with over seven different teachers. We also have monthly meetings as well as courses and classes in there for you. So if that's something that interests you and you wanna be around like-minded women who all want the same things as you, which is to become a better woman of God and to help you grow closer to God by keeping you accountable and all these fun things, then you definitely want to go to younghomemakersclub.com to join or you can go down to the description below but that being said let's get right into the video okay so it's been a moment since i've done the q a so i'm excited let's just keep it chill today well unless it's like big hitting topics we'll see all right so the first question that i have here is tips for those who are young but want to be mothers and good wives if i was you and you're not a mom and you're not a wife yet but you want to be a good wife and mom one day, I would prepare for it, honestly. Um, I am a wife, I'm not a mother, so I can't really speak to motherhood, even though I do talk about motherhood sometimes, I'm not, my, I'm not a mom yet, right? So I don't really know until I get there. But that being said, if I were you, I would prepare for it. One thing that I do to prepare for motherhood one day is I actually um, volunteer at my church's nursery and I love doing it because it's a way for me to learn how to change diapers or feed babies or whatever it may be. But I also get time around babies because I love children. So it's a great way to volunteer and help your church, but also learn about things for children one day, right? Maybe you want to be a mom and you want to have um, a job centered around babysitting so that you can get some ideas for how it would be like one day. These are some great ways to prepare for motherhood. Also just learning from other women in your life. If you are wanting to be a good wife one day, the first thing that I would say for sure is to go to scripture, learn what the Bible says about biblical womanhood, Proverbs 31, Titus 2, 3 through 5, read the fruits of the spirit and start practicing them. It's really important for us as Christian women to be close with God and to learn about what scripture says about how we should be acting as women. If I wasn't married right now and I was trying to prepare for marriage, that's one of the best things that I would do. I would just learn more about what scripture says about womanhood and grow into a feminine, kind, gentle woman so that I can be prepared for motherhood. I mean, for wifehood and of course motherhood too, because we want to be gentle moms to our babies and children. Another thing that I would say if you are wanting to do that is if you want to be a good wife and mother, I would have a great relationship with God. And that's kind of basically what I said, but have a great relationship with God and get into wise counsel, maybe even have friendships with women who are wanting the same things as you. And that's why I talk about Young Homemakers Club, which is our community for young women. It's a great way to prepare for motherhood one day. So hopefully those tips helped you. And if you did wanna learn more about communication or some things that could help you to prepare for respecting your husband one day, you can go to my last podcast episode where I brought on a happy wife of over 15 years and we delved into some great conversation about love and respect and was it and what it says in scripture. So hopefully that helped. <laughs> All right, the next question is biblical submission. And I actually get this question a lot. And there's actually a couple more questions that says, what is submitting? How do you submit to your husband without feeling like a maid? Another lady said, how do I submit to my husband without him walking all over me? And it's so sad that in our culture, we believe that submitting to our husband is a way for us to be like his slave or like his maid when that's not at all the case. God has created a beautiful design for man and women. 
man to submit to God and the wife submit to her husband. And this could also be misconstrued for us women to think or for the church to tell women sometimes that they just submit to men in general when that's also not the case. We're not just supposed to submit to any man. Before we're married, we are to submit to our parents, our father and mother. And when we are married as women, we are to submit to our husbands. Now, what is submitting? Well, let's look at the exact definition. Submission is to voluntarily take a position where you put your trust in someone else and heed their leadership. Submission is not slavery, coercion, manipulation, intimidation, misguidance, or suppression. Submission is a voluntary act that we as wives do with our husbands where we heed his leadership and follow what he believes that God is leading us towards as a family. Now, let's think about a team, right? There's always a captain that makes the last call. And that's basically what our husband is. He's someone who makes the big decisions for our family. And as as women, sometimes I understand it can feel like, well, that means that I can't make any decisions or that means that I'm the slave. That's not the case at all. A good man is going to talk to his wife and discuss his with his wife what her thoughts are and go to her with discussion so that they can make a decision together. But at the end of the day, if the husband feels like it's God calling him and the family to go a certain way, then it's the wife's job to voluntarily submit and do what her husband feel is, is best. And the thing is, when it comes to submission, is it's actually a beautiful thing for us as wives because we don't have to <laughs> we don't have to carry that big burden on our shoulders. If you go to Ephesians 5, you will see that it says for us to submit and respect our husbands, but there's a huge part of, of Ephesians 5 that's all about what the husband has to do, which is lay his life down for his wife and do all these things for his wife and love the wife and nourish her and treasure her like Christ loves the church, like Christ died for the church. So it is the husband's job to lay his life down and it is the wife's job to submit and follow after his leadership. So all that's to say is that as women, we can take that burden off of our shoulders because that is what the men carry. The man can carry that burden of being the leader of the family so that we don't have to. Our things are to be homemakers, to be busy in the home, as it says in Titus 2, 3 through 5, and to understand that our husband has our best interest at heart. That's the thing. If you marry a good man, a good man of God, who you know is following the Lord and is submitting to the Lord, then we can understand that us submitting to our husband is God's design because he is submitting to God. And that being said, because of that, we are submitting to God because we are submitting to our husbands and we are submitting to what God is saying in scripture. And it is just a beautiful thing. Another wonderful thing about submission, biblical submission, and I have to say biblical submission because there's some weird things out there. Okay, I'm talking about what scripture says in God's perfect design. It allows us to really trust our husbands. Like when it comes to submission, we wanna trust our husbands and if there is times where let's say you there's a situation and it could even be small things too like let's say you know choosing the restaurant whatever it may be you know um let's say there's a decision and your husband makes the wrong decision or wasn't the right one for your family that's also doesn't fall on you as a woman that's that's a, that's a great thing for me too that I think and that sounds kind of bad but just hear me out what I'm what I'm trying to say is that if your husband makes a decision and it's the wrong decision I'm not saying that we as wives should nag them or tell them see I told you so you shouldn't have done you shouldn't have done it your way you should have done it my way x y and z I'm not saying that at all what I'm trying to say is that that doesn't fall on you your husband answers to God for his decisions that he makes for your family. It's our job as wives to love our husbands and trust him even in the times where he might make the wrong decision. Um, there might be big decisions that that he makes 
And submission really comes into play when you guys don't agree. Because at the end of the day, it's still the husband's job to make the last decision and to be the leader of the family. Now, when it says, how do you submit to your husband without feeling like a maid? I don't feel like a maid at all. I feel good. I feel amazing that I know I have a husband who is looking after my best interest, who knows that he is following God and that he's listening to God and he's following what the scripture says. I don't feel like a maid at all. I feel peace. That's what I feel. I feel like biblical submission is a way for us as women and men to both feel peace and to do what God has called us to do. So I would change your mindset when it comes to submission. And I would start thinking about submission as a way for us as wives, for you as a wife, to feel peace. Because do you really want to always be nagging him and arguing with him over everything? Who cares if he makes the wrong decision about something? At the end of the, I mean, it it matters, right? But at the end of the day, that in a way is his fault. He made that decision for your family. And at the end of the day, we don't always have to be nagging and arguing and every single thing when it comes to submission. It's just a beautiful thing. All of that is to say that submission is a way for us to follow God because it says in scripture to submit to our husbands. So we're honoring God by doing that. And I would just pray that you will change your mindset on that. Change your mindset on what submission is. Read scripture and understand that is actually a way to take that load of leadership off of our backs as women and understand that our husband isn't trying to boss us around and be a dictator. He is doing these things out of our best interest and out of leadership and out of his duty as a man, which is to protect and provide for us and to submit to God. So I really pray that you would feel differently about this and understand that it's if you married a good man, right? If you married a good man, then his job and his desire isn't to walk all over you. His desire is to do what's best for you and for the family. And sometimes it may be you disagreeing and he's still making a decision that you don't agree with. And in those situations, we should still submit because that's what God has called us to do. Another thing that I will say though, if he, and I, I talked about this a little earlier, but if he does make the wrong decision, it's also our job as wives to not nag him or tell him that he should have followed what we said instead. It's our job as wives to comfort him and to be there for him and to show him that we are still there for him and that we are still in his corner and that we still support him even when he makes a decision and it wasn't the right one. Maybe he thought that he was hearing something from God, but it wasn't actually the right way. So it's our job to still comfort it's our job to still support our husbands and to be his biggest cheerleader. That's kind of what one of the videos we talk about in Young Homemakers Club. We talk about submission in marriage. It's an hour-long interview with Madi as well in Young Homemakers Club exclusively. And we talk all about this and it's so good. So I hope that that was helpful for you. Let's get on to the next question. Let's pause really quick and talk about my favorite tortilla chip brand, Masa Chips. If you know me, you know that I am super against eating seed oils. And it's been really hard when it comes to tortilla chips because as you guys know, all of the chips at the store are made with vegetable oils and oils that just aren't good for you. So that being said, I was so happy to find masa chips because they're actually made with corn and it's organic corn that's naturally nixtamalized, 100% grass-fed beef tallow and sea salt. That's all these ingredients are. I feel so good after eating these chips. They're way different than like the store-bought brands or even like the better brands at the store. These are the only tortilla chips that I trust. And the best thing is, is that they actually have multiple flavors too. So I have the Cabanero flavor. This one is almost reminiscent of like a Dorito. We also have the lime flavor and I think this one is so delicious and my favorite part is like even the flavored ones they're just made with like organic lime that's it organic lime organic corn 100 grass fed beef tallow and sea salt so all of their ingredients are so good they have the original kind and then they also have the churro flavor that i'm really really obsessed with so if you are interested in that like eating without seed oils you definitely want to try masa chips and my favorite thing is that they are giving you guys 20 percent off when you use my code homemaker all you have to do 
Go to masterchips.com, use code HOMEMAKER and get 20% off on your first order of chips. You guys are gonna love them. You definitely won't regret it because they actually have a crunch to them. They're actually just, they're just so good. You'll see what I mean. So go and use code HOMEMAKER and get Masa Chips today. All right, let's get back into our video. How should I deal with toxic family members? So when it comes to family members, I thankfully don't really have this situation right now happening in my life, but if I was in the situation where I was dealing with toxic family members, I would set boundaries. I just finished reading a book called Boundaries actually, and it was so good because it talked about scripture and how boundaries are actually a great thing. Boundaries aren't bad. So I would set boundaries with your family. I don't know exactly how they're being toxic. If you're married, maybe they're trying to come between you and your family. Um, you and your husband, if that's the case, then I highly recommend that you set boundaries with them because obviously our marriage comes first before our family because we became one flesh with our husband. So if that's the case, set boundaries with your family. Um, if it's them talking down to you or them doing wrong things to you, I am someone who is okay with having a tough conversation with someone and lovingly telling them that you need space or that right now you can't help them out with something. Maybe it's them asking you for money all the time, whatever it may be. You are being loving by telling them that right now is not the time. Like if let's say someone keeps on borrowing money from you, but they aren't paying it back. Maybe that's the situation. It says in scripture that you are that the borrower is a slave to the lender. So do you wanna make your family member a slave by them always borrowing things from you, right? So I would say the loving thing is to set boundaries. And if they get mad at that, then that is honestly something that's kind of a them problem. And and they might be mad at that. They, they might because a lot of times people have problems with boundaries because they wanna have access to you all the time, especially if they're your family. But at the end of the day, you have to do what is right for you and your husband and your children. And, and honestly, that, that unit comes first, at least to me, and I believe that's what it says in scripture, you know, how you leave and cleave to your wife. So if that's kind of the case, all I would say is at the end of the day, set, set healthy boundaries with them and be okay with the fact that they're, they might be mad about it, but you kind of have to do what's best for your family. So that's what I would do if I was in that situation with toxic family members. I don't know the exact situation, but hopefully that helped you. Also want to share that I'm not a therapist. I'm not a professional, you know, do what you want. <laughs> so I would like to say that if, I, if I'm giving advice or if I'm like doing this, like I'm not a teacher. I'm sharing like what I would do in these situations or hopefully things that I say are helping you. That being said, let's talk about this other question. I am wooed by a sweet provider-minded man, but doesn't have much. How do I get him to spoil me? Well, if he doesn't have much, he can't really spoil you, can he? What I would say is that if you are wooed by a provider-minded man and he's sweet, I would look at his work ethic and I would look at the trajectory of his career because at the end of the day, if you are a woman who desires to be a mom one day, a stay-at-home mom one day, it is so important for you to marry a man who wants to be a provider. Even if you didn't become a mom one day, I think it's really important for us as women to marry men who want to be a provider and who can provide and who is on a trajectory to provide. So when it comes to how do I get him to spoil me, I mean, <laughs> I don't really have much for you on that because at the end of the day, if he doesn't have the money to give you things and he can't do that right now, but... I will say that if he is a sweet man who is a godly man and who has a, tra a career trajectory and you know for a fact that he will grow in his career, maybe he's just like in school right now and he's just working a low end, lower end job, but when he's done with school, you know that he's going to get a great, a great job, X, Y, and Z. Um, I would say like, I don't think there's a problem with that. I don't think there's a problem with being with a man that you can see has a career trajectory and who is a good godly man and who has a provider mentality and he wants to provide for you. That's amazing. I'm not saying that he has to be rich for you to marry him, but he should definitely have a career trajectory before you decide to settle down with him. And he should definitely have a provider mindset. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But when it comes to the spoiling part, I mean, at the end of the day, um, 
provider-minded men a lot of times do want to do sweet things for their wives, but if he doesn't have the money right now, then he can't do that for you, right? And this happens a lot of times with young people who get married and um, they just don't have money right off the bat because a lot of times young men aren't established yet in their career. Career establishment usually happens later 20s, early 30s, 30s, 40s, and stuff like that. Usually it takes money for a man to spoil you, right? But if you are someone who like loves gifts or whatever, honestly, I would gently talk to him and ask him what his goals are one day for when it comes to you guys. If he is a man who has a good career trajectory, a godly man, and you want to marry him, maybe I would say, hey, baby, what are your desires for me one day? One of my top love languages is gifts, and it would mean a lot to me if I got more of them. And it doesn't have to be anything big but I would really appreciate that from you. Like I would I would gently bring it up to him. If that is something that you desire to be spoiled with gifts, bring it up to him. Now, do I think that it is something that we should expect just to have gifts all the time? I don't think so. Like that, I don't think that's a requirement to have a great marriage at all. But if it is something that you desire, that you desire gifts, I would bring it up to him and talk to him and have real conversations before you settle down with him when it comes to everything that you just said in that question. So hopefully that helped. All right, let's go to the next one. Let's pause really quick and talk about baby brew activities. If you have a baby or a toddler, you definitely want to get these decks of cards because these cards are actually purposeful playtime activities so that you can keep your baby entertained, but also help them reach milestones in their journey as a baby. One thing that I didn't realize is that babies' brains grow so much in their first year of life. And that's why I'm so excited because these activity cards are so beneficial for your babies and you don't even need really expensive toys or things that you have to get them all you need is this deck of cards so let's open one of them we, let's see baby racing on the back it tells you what to do race your baby to their favorite toy place a toy a few feet away it tells you exactly what to do with your baby and it also gives you different photos so that you can actually have that as a reference my also one of my favorite things too is that they also use a diverse diverse images of babies so cute because i'm hispanic my husband is black so it's so cute to see like different colors of babies too i'm just saying like that is just so adorable so i really appreciate that they put so much effort into this i actually know the owner of this company she's one of my close friends so you guys are helping a good small business if you also get these as well and one of my favorite things too is that on the card it tells you different milestones that they're reaching so you definitely want to try these out if you have a baby or a toddler and you want to keep them occupied and have playtime activities with them and help them grow so i'm really excited that they actually gave me a 10 percent off code for you guys all you have to do is go to babybrewactivities.com use code homemaker and you can get 10% off of their childhood decks. You definitely want to get them for your babies or for your friends. That being said, let's get right back into the video. How to be supportive to my partner while he is healing his porn addiction. Wow. Okay. That is a really heavy topic. And honestly, I am not very well versed in this. I would love to get someone on the podcast in the future to talk about this because I know it is a problem in men and women when it comes to porn, right? I think one of the top things is for me, if I was in that situation, I would not condemn him because I understand if I was in that situation, I would feel betrayed, I would feel hurt, I would feel a lot of things, angry, all the all the uh, stages of grief probably, I'd be so angry about it and sad, but I would not condemn him and I would pray for him and I would see if he could meet with someone. Maybe you have a trusted male counselor or pastor that you could talk with together as a married couple. I don't know. That's how I would support him if I was in that situation when it comes to a porn addiction. So hopefully that helped. I definitely would say to pray, pray, pray when it comes to that and um, to really be intentional and to definitely seek wise counsel in your church if you have someone that you could trust when it comes to this situation. All right, let's read the next question. What are some specific ways I can be praying for my boyfriend when it comes to maturity? Now, if he's not very mature, I would question why he's your boyfriend and that sounds so mean, but what I'm trying to say is that like 
we should be dating for marriage and if you guys aren't on the marriage trajectory yet and he's not mature so that means that maybe he's not ready for marriage or he's not he doesn't want to be married i would honestly consider your relationship <laughs> but if you are so dead set on marrying him and you want to pray for him to mature what i would say is to pray that he gets wise counsel and good brotherhood in his life I think it's an amazing thing for men to be around other godly men and to learn from each other, men who maybe are even doing better than him so that he can see what life would be like if he was more motivated and disciplined and if he had a wife and all these different things. Yeah, so that's what I would say. I would say to pray that he would find wise counsel so that he can become more mature and someone that he can trust to look up to and um, hopefully that will help him become more mature. But at the end of the day, we can't change him. We cannot change our boyfriends we cannot change the men in our life only god can do that and the best thing that we can do as women is pray and like i said before i would really consider your relationship because if you are desiring for marriage one day if he's not mature then how will you guys be getting married you know so really think about that when it comes to your relationship my next question here is how do I deal with a work bully in a woman of God way because I want to deal with her in the flesh? So when it comes to a work bully, I was just talking about toxic family members and how you should have boundaries with them. I also believe that you should have boundaries with work bullies. I am someone who strongly believes that when you are working, you should just have decency and respect for each other, right? We're just trying to go to work and get work done and go home. We don't need the drama. We don't need the attitude, all these different things. And if I had a problem with a coworker, I would set her aside if you are in person and I would gently tell her, hey, I don't really appreciate how you've been speaking with me right now or how you were speaking with me in this situation or what you said to me there or how you've been doing X, Y, and Z. Is there something we can talk about? Did I do something? Would you like to talk about that now? And I would just have the tough conversation because at the end of the day it can be really easy to just ignore the people at work and try to be passive aggressive to them or whatever but it's still going to come up right if if we don't address it how is it going to stop and a lot of times people don't like to be addressed because they're they realize wow i didn't know that she was actually going to be serious and talk to me about this because people are afraid to have confrontation but what I would say as and a way to do it as a woman of God is to just be truthful and move them aside. Like, don't do it in front of people. I would put it, put them aside, ask them, hey, is there something going on? You like to talk about it, you know, and maybe do it in a way where you're like caring about them. Maybe they're just having a bad day or whatever. That's how I, I would look at it. I would just like move them aside and really have a conversation with them. What I would say is, I understand that we might not be the bestest of friends at work and we don't have to be, but it would be lovely if when we're at work, we just can have decency and respect for each other and just go home. We could just have a great time here at work by being respectful and we can just go home without all of the drama. I would literally just say that. <laughs> so yeah, I, that's what I would say when it comes to dealing with things at work. Um, being Christians, it doesn't mean that we have to be walked all over or that we have to, um, that we have to be disrespected all the time. Like it's okay to just speak up and gently talk to people about something and just be 100% honest about how you feel. Like, hey, I, I really didn't appreciate how you spoke to me this time. Did I say something? You know, like I just ask them. And um, hopefully that will help in that situation. Let's pause really quick and talk about Birthright. Birthright is an all natural supplement company that believes that women need to return to better ways for being in tune with their bodies, cycles, and hormones through the wisdom of the past. I found this company a couple weeks ago, I actually met the founder, and I was just blown away by these vitamins and prenatals. If you are a woman who has been looking for a good prenatals that doesn't have bad ingredients in it you definitely want to try this out i've been using them for the past couple weeks it's been great so far and my favorite part is that 
I know every single ingredient in this prenatal. It is so, so good. It's all natural, non-GMO, grass-fed and grass-finished, sustainably sourced from regenerative farms. They really care about the ingredients that they put into their prenatals and their everyday vitamins. They have a revived hormone support, and then they also have a bloom prenatal, and I take these every day. It's for preconception and pregnancy, pregnancy support. I also love their branding. I mean, look how stunning this bottle is. It's all in an amber glass jar. I mean, they just put so much time and effort into these vitamins. You definitely want to go and give them a try and let me know how it goes. Just use code HOMEMAKER to get 10% off on your first order. And let's get right back into the episode. All right, the next question is, did you feel a zing when you first met your husband? Like, did you feel something? Okay, let me be honest when it comes to this aspect. I feel like many times us as women are looking for that fairy tale Disney type romantic relationship when it comes to our husband. And we feel like once we feel something that a zing or whatever, then we'll know that that's the right man for us. But I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that it has to be some feeling or zing or whatever. I believe that we should choose our husband logically. And obviously, of course, we should still be attracted to him because that matters. And we should still, you know, have some chemistry and, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, I don't believe that you need to feel a zinc. You need to choose him logically by what type of man he is because feelings come and go. So before I got married, I didn't feel a zing. Of course, I thought he was handsome and we had so much fun together and he made me laugh and all these wonderful things. But I also knew that he was a man of God, that he had a plan for our future, that he wanted to provide for me. He wants children. He wants to travel. He has all these business ideas. He is a good man and he's gentle and kind to me. When I saw him talk to his mom and talk to his sisters, I saw him be kind. When he talked to women in general, I saw him be respectful, never flirtatious, but respectful. And he always made me feel respected in those situations when he spoke to other women. I saw the type of man that he was and I knew that because of that, he was going to be a wonderful husband and a wonderful father to our children one day. And I think that us as women can actually miss out on a great man if we're just trying to look for some zing or a feeling. That being said, I chose my husband logically because I knew that we just would fit together. And the thing is, is that after you get married is really when all the romance comes in. At least that's what I believe and that's what happened with me. After we got married, that's when we could really get romantic. That's when we could really get to know each other and where it was like completely different where now I feel like I live in a Disney movie because I just feel so at peace and so in love and infatuated with my husband and we grew closer after we got married. So I think it's more important to just choose that husband logically and obviously you want to have you know, like I said, you want to find him attractive and you want to have a good time with whatever. You want to be able to have chemistry. But at the end of the day, you guys will learn and grow closer together after you get married. And it's a beautiful thing. So I don't think it has to be some fairy tale romantic thing. I knew my husband was going to be my husband. Well, when I met him, I thought that he would, you know, I thought that he was so handsome and, you know, thought he was great. But you don't have to feel some zing. You have to choose logically because there will be people that you have chemistry with that you definitely shouldn't marry. There's going to be people that you meet that you enjoy each other. You have a fun time. You laugh together. But at the end of the day, you aren't going to actually marry them because they aren't the right type of man. They don't want to be a provider. They don't want to be a husband or they don't want to have children. You know, you have to just decide on that. All right. So the last question that I want to answer today is I'm unsure if I want children because of the direction the world is going. However, I for sure want to be a good homemaker and wife to someone. Is this a sin? I understand that fear because you don't want your children to grow up in a place like this, but think about it, right? There's been bad scenarios and wars and rumors of wars in every single generation so all that to say is that god will still provide that god will still be with them and at the end of the day this world is not our home we are the children of the father father god so what i would say to you is to not fear 
don't fear it. Embrace it. Embrace children. Embrace what God has ordained for us, which is to have children. It says in Genesis, right? To be fruitful and multiply. It also says that children are a blessing from the Lord and a reward from him. And that blessed is the man who fills his quiver with children. And I believe that it is important for us as women to have children. I really do think so. And I, th I think it's important. And I don't think that every single person will be a mother. I understand that there are situations where people aren't able to have children and my heart goes out to those people. I know that's that is just so tragic. I also want to talk about the fact that think about the impact that you have in the world when it comes to your children. I think that it is Satan's desire for us as Christian marriages to not have children. If he can get rid of all these children by abortion and if he can make women believe that this world is not a good place for children and if he can make christians believe that they're doing a good by not having children then that's another generation of christians that he's taking out of our world right that he is having a hand in doing what i'm trying to say is that we are making a difference by what we do in the home raising them up to love the lord and to follow what it says in scripture so I believe that you are doing a good to the world by having children. So, and what's that going to do? It says in scripture, raise up a child in the way he should go. And when he is older, he won't depart from it. So us as Christian women, when we raise up our children in the way he should go, when he's older, when they are older, they are going to keep on following God and they are going to follow in those footsteps. They're going to get married to a godly man or woman. They are going to raise their children up in the way they should go as well. And that's another generation that you are changing. They're also making better decisions in the world, right? I believe that it is Satan's agenda for us as believers to not have children. I So I think that just merely having children and raising them up to love God and to teach them how to live a godly life you are already changing the world for the better. So if you want to be a good homemaker and wife to someone, I believe that you should also desire to raise your children up in the way that they should go, like how it says in scripture, and to have children and to allow God to give you those blessings because you are doing a wonderful thing for the kingdom when you do that, when you raise children up for the Lord. I truly believe that. I truly believe that us as women are making a change for generations when it comes to what we do in our home. So I really pray that you will think about this. Think about your idea of not wanting children. Think about what it says in scripture. Maybe ask wise counsel. And I need to do more research on whether it's a sin or not to not have children. I'm still trying to understand that for myself, to be honest. Because I never thought that birth control was bad until I started hearing some different homemakers talk about how we should leave children up to God, like allow God to do what he should do with our lives and allow God to decide how many children we have in X, Y, and Z. So hopefully that will help in your decision of having a child or not and your question. I hope that you enjoyed that q a i'm really excited for our next episode where we are gonna get into one of my latest posts that went viral a little controversial about dating and finding a husband so we're gonna have a good time in our next episode i will see you there